Welcome into the college football show presented by FantasyInsiders.com. Dan Strapper, Joe DeSalvo, and Sean Newsham with you this week. Ben Pritchett has the week off. Jordan Case could not make it, so we we draft a, a capable backup here. You always love the backup QB. You, you love the McCown brothers. You know, you love these guys. And here's Sean Newsham to come in. Sean, if you could, um, a b- brief background. I know Fantasy Insiders folks know you from when you've been on the podcast. Uh, but but what, what are you bringing to the table tonight as an analyst of college football? Uh, you know, hopefully I can bring some good information for everyone. Uh, I'm a member of Team K-Can, and I do all the college football, hockey stuff. So if you ever see uh, lineups out there for college football and hockey and whatnot, most likely I've done everything. Um, so I, those are my two main sports. I put in a lot of effort with those, uh, those sports, focus on them mainly, let Kyle handle the other stuff. Um, so hopefully I can provide some good information here tonight. No, Travis, Ben is on vacation, though he is lingering in chat. So he may have to answer to his wife at a different time for, for being present here on Spreecast. But uh, uh, Ben is in chat. So if you have specific questions for Benjamin, you can feel free to ask. But this week on Fantasy Insiders, Jordan Case wrote up uh, the midweek slate. And then Fear the Turtle wrote up Saturday and uh, Saturday early, Saturday late will be coming uh, later tomorrow. So um, if you are not yet a Fantasy Insiders member, you can go to fantasyinsiders.com slash plans and, and check out how you can get on board. Uh, but uh, Fear the Turtle, the, the write-up is very, very good. Um, I, I always talk about how great Ben's is. Um, Fear the Turtle, uh, his uh, nom de plume, as it were, uh, is... Uh, he did a great job this week, so if you're on board, check it out, and we'll go through some top plays here. Uh, we'll talk about some uh, cheaper options, help you build your foundation for Saturday, uh, and get you through uh, tonight's episode of the College Football Show with Joe and Sean. Now, Joe, if you could, as always, looking back last week, storylines, what are we looking at? What did you see uh, from a injury standpoint? What did you see from a result standpoint that you think can influence this discussion tonight that we're having here on on Spreecast? I, I I think the, the 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 you know the the common theme is it holds true offense 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 right now Baylor TCU Bowling Green I mean the top guys have been consistently the top guys all year I think that's what we're seeing a lot of offense and and for us fantasy college fantasy football guys we love that right I think one thing that's going to change a little bit this week is there's a lot of defense on the slate I think I went through the whole schedule and there's about five games on the schedule where the over unders only in the 40s and the point spread is a field goal or less, and there's like four games where the total's in the 30s. So you've got about eight games, you know, total on the college slate this week where there doesn't seem to be like there's going to be a whole lot of scoring. You know, you you could reference Northwestern, Michigan. We can go on the list, and I'm sure we'll touch on some of those, Arkansas, Alabama, as we go. From an injury standpoint, there's really not a lot on this week that we have to worry about other than maybe a Dalvin Cook over there at Florida State. Is he going to be okay? Maybe some wide receivers at Texas Tech. A new Solomon, the quarterback at Arizona, looks like he's going to be a go. And then other than that, maybe a couple of question marks. Debbie and Smith over at Michigan. Nate Sudfeld and Jordan Howard at Indiana might have some questions. And then Leonto Carew. Uh, wide receiver Rutgers reinstated, so now he's a factor. I don't know how much he plays this week. But with his talent, you figure he's going to be on the field at some point against Michigan State. Yeah, the uh, not not that I'm aware of the situation at all. But uh, Norris Will uh, Wilson, the uh, interim head coach there at Rutgers, because it's been such a bang up season for the Scarlet Knights uh, from the police blotter standpoint, um, has uh, said that Carew is a senior. He's a captain. They're not afraid to throw him right in there. He doesn't know if he's going to start or not. Uh, but don't be surprised if he is heavily involved in the offense. And when you've had an offense that has struggled as much as Rutgers has. Um, inserting your best playmaker certainly uh, should help you out uh, a bit there. But we'll, we'll hit the night slate a little little later. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on the early slate to begin just because it's a little bit bigger, a little bit of the, the names that we've talked about more and more uh, throughout the show. And, and you mentioned the, the Baylors of the world. And, Sean, we have Baylor, Kansas. And this feels like it's setting up to be one of those games that a lot of people are going to be on from a Baylor perspective because – Kansas just is not a good college. They're just not a good team. They they can't play defense. Um, the one question here may be whether or not Baylor gets up big early and maybe moves some second or third guys on the depth chart in and out. But this is college football. That typically doesn't happen. 
is that a gain that you in your early research here tonight have, have honed in on or, or are you looking elsewhere because of the possibility of high ownership in that one? Um, generally, a lot of the time I'll try to stay away from massive spreads. Once the spread gets above about 30 points, it becomes a real crapshoot with who's going to get their production. Now, Baylor's going to score anyways, but what you'll run into is Baylor might score, let's say, six touchdowns in the first half, and that'll be about it what those guys will get. So the problem with that is is you really have to pinpoint where you're going to get it from. If you're paying the 10K for Seth Russell or the 8, 9K for uh, Coleman, you're really expecting them to get about four or five touchdowns for Russell, about two to three and a hundred plus yards for Coleman. So it makes it difficult to pinpoint them exactly. Um, I don't really care for Shock Linwood on the ground this week. I do, however, think that you could target Coleman. Coleman's been just unbelievable thus far this year, and you can't really go wrong with him. However, you do run the risk of him not producing as much. I do like Johnny Jefferson. What they've been doing with Jefferson is once the game's been staying close-ish, Jefferson's been getting the looks. That's been the issue with Terrence Williams is the last couple weeks people expected him to get more looks, but he doesn't come in until it's a complete blowout. This week might be a week for him, but Jefferson at about 4,500 on DraftKings is a pretty good target to get some goal line carries, maybe 10 to 15 carries. And then Katie Cannon, Jay Lee, those guys are also in play as well as Coleman. Yeah, Travis, don't worry. Travis Wilson in chat. We're, we're here for you. If anyone on chat isn't chatting with you, we, we, we got your back. So so don't worry. Keep keep the comments coming uh, and we will uh, keep in touch with you to make sure uh, we bring you everything you need to know. Uh, Joe, if we're looking at this, like you already mentioned some of those lower over unders. Uh, this is a situation where we may have to worry a little bit more about defense than we have in the past. Over at the CFF site, when you, you're doing your rankings and you're going through your process of really trying to give your uh, subscribers and, and your readers what they want and what they need to set their uh, season long and their daily lineups, is that where you go first over-unders? Are you looking at specific matchups? Uh, is this a harder week than most because of these lower numbers? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It, 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 Dan, it, sometimes it just depends on the matchups. We just referenced Baylor, Kansas, right? I mean, the one thing that's worth noting is is that Kansas is probably going to be – Kansas is without their starting quarterback this week. So I actually have Jefferson targeted as a value guy in the DraftKings as well because we're going to reference later in the show, and I'll kind of give a sneak peek of where we're going with this. But last week we, we kind of pointed out some guys that may overperform or underperform based on where we have them in the rankings. I'm worried about Shock Linwood at this week as well. I, I think he has the potential to put up a lot of points, but you know, if Baylor jumps out to a big lead, you know, they're gonna pull back the reins and it makes guys like Jefferson that much more valuable. But you know, sometimes it doesn't really matter. It's just all about the matchups. It's just whether or not you've got two defensive juggernauts going at each other, like uh, you know, look, Travis said Northwestern Michigan equals gross, right? I mean, <laughs> it's going to be one of those defensive matchups, and we're going to touch on some guys in our start bench later on. Uh, I don't know if you even touch anybody in a contest like that. Some of the differences between the two slates, you do have the uh, Western Kentucky, Middle Tennessee on, on DraftKings. You're going to see, I think there are a four-game difference, if I remember looking at the, the two different slates from site to site. Again, you need to take them separately. It, it's always you can import players, meaning your your research obviously is, is important on both sites. But when it comes to price tags and comes to how you're constructing your lineups, some of these value guys and some of these top plays are, are not going to be available on each site. So make sure uh, that you're reading and that you're you're paying attention to which site you're being specific to as you're constructing your lineups and as you're trying to move forward. So if yeah. we get into position by position here, guys, and uh, Sean, you already touched on a, a couple from the Baylor lineup. Um, who are you focusing in on as a, a quarterback play, and are you paying up uh, this Saturday to lock in a, a top-tier quarterback, or do you see some value elsewhere that may allow you to to find some of those big play wide receivers and running backs later on? Uh, you know, I like some of the top-tier quarterbacks. I like Pat Mahomes a lot. I like Baker Mayfield. Uh, I even like Brandon Dowdy and Matt Johnson. The spread in the Bowling Green State game is obviously about 80, basically what they've been doing every week. Uh, they like to throw the ball around. The only issue you get with that is Matt Johnson isn't a big runner, and neither is Dowdy. And especially when you look at FanDuel and DraftKings, you really need the rushing stats in college football to to get moving. Um, I'm honestly looking a lot more in the middle tier this week. I like people like, like Fronopel. Now, granted, he's not going to rush as much, but... 
they're going to throw the ball around quite a bit. Same game as Matt Johnson. Uh, he's going to throw the ball to Tajay Sharp all day, which we'll get to, I'm sure, later. I like Josh Dobbs a lot. Uh, for Ben Pritch, I like Brent Stockstill a lot. Um, that's obviously a DraftKings play. And I really like Seth Collins. I was really impressed what he did the other weekend against uh, Stanford. Now, he didn't put up a massive stat line against Stanford, but he's been pretty good overall. He's played Michigan, Stanford. They've both been very tough defensively. But even the game against Stanford, he played pretty well. And he's been very good against uh, lesser competition. Arizona's defense isn't that strong. And with his dual threat ability, he could see 10 to 15 carries if they're playing from behind. You could look at 50, 60 total output plays from him. So I really like Seth Collins at his price point on both sites, honestly. Joe, following up on quarterbacks, yep. uh, one, are, are you in agreement there? Is anybody of what Sean mentioned stand out to you, or, or are there guys that maybe you're staying away from for, for one reason or another? Another. No, you know what? I, you know, we talked about Baylor and whether or not you should fade any of those guys, and, and I think if there's anybody worth jumping on, Seth Russell is definitely the one, and Corey Coleman. I mean, one, two. I mean, they've just been as solid as you can be, right? I mean, you've got the Matt Johnsons, you've got Brandon Doty, so you have you've got the big guns. When you look at some of the value plays I looked at, I couldn't agree with you more. I have Seth Collins on both sites. I, I just think there's too much value where he's at going against Arizona. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later in our start bench. I think he's a tremendous value play. I even think uh, Blake Chronicle as well is, is on both sites is a good play. I, you know, Sam Richardson on FanDuel, I think, has some good value too going up against Texas Tech. And, and I wouldn't even cut out Deshaun Kaiser over there at Notre Dame on FanDuel. He's 62, he's 6,200 and he's going against Navy this week. When you've got a receiver like he does in Will Fuller, you know, he's potential to, you know, he's got potential to throw up 300 yards and three touchdowns against the Navy defense. That Navy Notre Dame game is one of my favorite games to watch typically on, on the college football season. Just a, a little bit more uh, juice to that one. Most Notre Dame games, because they're all rivalries, tend to have a little bit extra to them. But it'll be an intriguing matchup to watch and, and see if uh, Navy can continue uh, running the ball the way they do against most defenses uh, throughout their season. As we talk about quarterbacks, Sean, are you a quarterback first guy or are you a matchup first guy? Are you looking at constructing your lineups around one quarterback and moving on? Or are you trying to find that one or two high price guy and then building from there, whether running back or, or wide receiver or quarterback? Uh, it's honestly a weekly dependent thing for me. A lot of the time I'll be matchup dependent. I want to see where the value is. Now that said, like last week, for example, I was all in on Seth Russell essentially and Greg Ward. Those were the two guys that played pretty much every lineup. Uh, it just so happened they were the more expensive guys. It, it really depends on the week. Like, for example, this week, um, Bronopel, Dobbs, Seth Collins, all those guys are around 7K, and I might choose them over Seth Russell, whereas last week I thought the game was going to be a little bit closer. Um, so I was all in on those guys. The weird thing, especially about Seth Russell, here's a little tidbit from last week, is Seth Russell had about 250 yards and about 70 or 80 rushing yards in the first half, give or take a few. He didn't hit either bonus. It looked like he was going to hit both bonuses, but because the game was such a blowout, they, uh, they actually didn't really use him at all in the second half. Um, but yeah, so it's a weekly dependent thing for me. It depends what value I can find at receiver and running back, and especially this year with the pricing difference due to the fact there's no tight end and instead another flex. It causes you to move down a little bit more. So if I can find a, a lot of value at running back or receiver, I might pay up more. Whereas if not, I might have to sacrifice a little bit. Makes a lot of sense. And I, I think the, the thing we've all learned, I've learned, especially over the past year and a half, two years of really focusing on daily fantasy is it, it's, it's different each week. And you can't get into a set way of doing something and thinking you have to spend at a certain position. That's when you really get behind the eight ball from a lineup construction standpoint and trying to pay up for uh, the Baylor quarterback, the Texas Tech quarterback, and, and get focused in on what doesn't matter, whereas what matters is getting into the, the locked-in, best matchup, who's going to give you the best return on the dollars you're spending, and then maybe spend elsewhere. Great great point there, Sean. If we turn our attention, Joe, to running back, we've already started to touch on some, as is the nature of, of talking about football and college yep. football. We're, we talk quarterback, you have to mention the running back and one of their top wide receivers. Who stands out to you? Is, is there a guy that you like above more – uh, more of the field uh, this week, or do you think there's enough value across uh, the position that you can really go a, a bunch of different ways? You know, when I look at Dan, when I look at value this week, I think right now, if you're going to pay up, I'm more willing to pay up at running back than I am at receiver and quarterback. I see a lot of value out there at quarterback. 
um, in the seven K seven, you know, seven K range. I see a lot of value there at wide receiver. If you're going to pay up, it might be the week to go ahead and go running back and go safe with your four nets. You got Ezekiel Elliott, you got your Nick Chubb. So you do have some heavy hitters here in the running back spot. We've got some value picks too, but this is, this is sort of the spot I think this week where there's enough value at quarterback and receiver where maybe, maybe you do pay up at running back. Sean, for, for you, I mean, this is a situation where we get to watch a guy like Leonard Fournette um, do what he does. And there's talk now of him potentially sitting out next season because he's not eligible for the NFL draft and whether or not they're going to push him this year. Last week, a lot of people expected him to be um, even, you know, Ben talked about it on here. Joe mentioned it. It, it looked like a blowout waiting to happen early, like an early blowout. But yet there he was being the, the key cog in that offense. Is there ever a reason, aside from price tag, to stay away from Fournette, or is he somewhat matchup proof with how talented he is? Uh, you know what? Uh, he's an interesting story. Usually I will stay away from stud running backs in big games. I have actually not rostered Fournette one time this year so far. It has not worked out that well so far. Um, the issue with it is their offense is just very bad, and they have not turned teams over and scored defensive touchdowns. So these games that have been looking like they would be massive blowouts – they haven't been able to score, except for Leonard Fournette. He's just a once-a-decade once type talent, and he's just unbelievable on the field. So once he gets going, he scores. And the thing is, is like a lot of the time in those type of games, with players like him, you see them lose touches to keep them rested because the team's winning by much. But Lou, LSU hasn't been able to score. So he's That's been right. in the games late, and it's... it's been a weird situation. I'm not sure if the, how sustainable that's going to be long-term, um, but like this week, I love Leonard Fournette because... They should be in a relatively close game, and they should need Fournette to carry them to victory in an important game. He's uh, whether, whether or not the whole sit-out next year happens, I, I can't see it happening. I get the whole ri injury risk mm -hmm. question, but he's he's their guy. And this is a situation where, they, as you said, they don't have much else, which is no. amazing to see, but he just does so much for that offense. Um, question in chat here, and we're turning back to quarterback for a second. I just want to address it. Sean, Joe, well, Joe, maybe we'll start with you. Any interest in Hackenberg? I, I, this is a guy that I think has been so well overrated in his collegiate career. Um, maybe at 3K, I'd start to, to figure him out. But um, do you see Hackenberg as a viable option this week? I, I'm also a Rutgers fan and Penn State quarterback, so his are, are not my favorite. I'll, I'll readily admit my bias there. But uh, for you, Joe, any interest in Hackenberg this week? I, I don't. I think Penn State's going to try to run the ball with whoever they get. Saquon Barkley is still questionable. Maybe they get him back this week. I, you know, I just see Penn State playing solid defense. And with, with Jordan Howard and Sudfeld still a question mark over at Indiana, I don't think Penn State's going to have to score a bunch of points this week anyway. John, how about you? Any interest in uh, old Christian? Yeah, I'm at, actually, as uh, you can probably tell by my screen name and whatnot, I'm a big Penn State fan. I went to school there. I've been a season ticket holder for a couple decades with my family. Uh, I love Hackenberg. However, I just don't think he's explosive in the offense. His price tag is really good. I actually marked him down maybe on DraftKings as second quarterback. But as Joe alluded to, I don't think Saquon Barkley plays. I don't think Akeel Lynch plays, which leads me to my value play in that spot of Nick Scott. I think Nick Scott's going to get carries in that game from everything I've read. Uh, you need to make sure you check on that, make sure that you see Barkley's out, Lynch's out, and just make sure that Scott's getting the ball instead of Thomas. And Nick Scott's at 4,300 on DraftKings. He could very easily see 20, 25 touches because, like Joe said, I think he's going. they're going to run the ball, and I think he's going to possibly have a nice game. The spread in that game is nice. Um, it's actually the highest spread, I think, Penn, it's, uh, the highest total Penn State's had all year, and they're a favorite to win, so it could be a good spot for him. Uh, ben chiming in in chat. Rule number one, don't use Hackenberg. Rule number two, don't use Hackenberg. <laughs> so uh, even from vacation, Ben has influence on the show, and we appreciate that, Benjamin. That, that is for sure. So let's continue here running back in this early slate. We touched on... Uh, Fournette and, and Scott here, we're kind of at the, the high end and the low end of, of the price pool there. Sean, maybe fill in some of these guys in between volume backs that you know are going to see a lot of work or guys that you think uh, maybe depth chart wise or injury wise may be one of these situations where pay attention to the news leading up to noon kickoff and you plug them in when you have the opportunity. Uh, you know, it looks like for the middle tier, uh, I like people like Mike Warren. I thought he had a really good game the other week. I think it's a decent matchup where he should at least get some run. 
Um, they might be down, but he caught a couple balls. So I, th- I like him. I think Nick Wilson should have a pretty good game. It looks like Anu Solomon's going to be back. Randall was so bad throwing the ball. I uh, just was able to pack people in the box. But I like Nick Wilson. I think you can run a little bit on the Oregon State defense. Um, those are a couple of the mid-range guys. You get down to like Travis Green. He's had a really good game. And I kind of like Wayne Gallman. I think Wayne Gallman is going to get about 20, 25 touches in the game. I think uh, he could have a nice 100-plus yards and maybe a touchdown or two for Clemson. Yep. Joe, how about yourself? Any other names? Yeah, Sean, that, I, I, I uh, agree. I have I have Wayne Gallman down on on FanDuel's as well. I have Warren, and I have Jordan Kinzeri at Iowa. You know, he's only fifty eight hundred playing against a really bad Illinois defense. Um, and so I think that's something that, that you have to take a look at. And even and even Patrick Scott, who's due to get back on track at Georgia Tech, I actually have him down on both sides as a good value play because he's probably going to get fifteen to seventeen carries. Um, looking over at DraftKings as well, some of the low value plays. I wouldn't even be surprised to see if, you know, if you're struggling to put together a lineup and you really need to just uh, fill a running back. I think Fred Coppett at, at Bowling Green uh, is going to get a bunch of carries against UMass this week. And, and don't be surprised to see Chris Swain get a bunch of carries for Navy. If that Notre Dame tries Notre Dame defense tries to take away Keenan Reynolds, Swain could end up with about 15, 20 carries himself. And he's only 4,400 on DraftKings this week. So, Joe, you mentioned the the two triple option or option running teams there with Navy and, and Georgia Tech and Sean and Joe asking you this question. Is that more of a, a risk factor where where you're yep. trying to target who's going to pick up the, the majority of it, whether the fullback or, or one of the wingbacks or quarterback is, is that too much of a risk or are you looking at price points? I'll start with you, Sean. Are you looking at price points there to see if there's value in the potential volume of one of these guys? Uh, yeah, a lot of the time I like to see who is the main cog in triple auctions like joe alluded to i i think patrick scove is the main option in the georgia tech game so generally they're going to get the main carries the triple options are just very very risky because you're basically you want it, the quarterback you know is the one that's going to touch the ball so generally you try to target them outside of that you try to look to see who gets the targets and then you try to figure out how they're going to stop the triple option now in the past navy has the last couple of years navy's given notre dame fits now, however, Notre Dame played Georgia Tech earlier this year, and they shut them down pretty effectively. So I'm trying to possibly stay away from that game just because I'm going to give Notre Dame credit to think that they finally f- have figured out the triple option. Once teams figure out the triple option, you see this a lot of the time in bowl seasons when a Georgia Tech or Navy plays in a bowl game. When teams have time to prepare for triple option teams, they generally struggle. And I just feel like Notre Dame showed that they can stop it earlier in the year, so I think they might have figured it out to an extent. A great, great point. Uh, covering back in the day Rutgers, we, uh, Rutgers played Army and Navy on varying years, and the coach always said the worst part was having to play them off a regular week. They tried to schedule them off a bye week because of that reason, give yourself an extra week to get ready for them. But to your point, Notre Dame already having played a triple option team has already put sort of that game plan into effect and should just be recalling it rather than going through it again. So an intriguing thought process there uh, on staying away from Navy, perhaps. I think we've touched on a number of running back options, uh, both in in the high tier, low tier. Uh, Joe, later on, start, sit. I'm sure you'll hit on some running backs Mm -hmm. as well, so we can uh, table that uh, for now. Touching on wide receiver, we've already Talked about Baylor and, and the options there, Sean. Uh, we know that they are a high-powered offense. We know that there are some big offensive over-under numbers on the slate. Who do you like at wide receiver? And in the higher tier prices, are there guys you're willing to build a roster around at wide out? Uh, you know, honestly, I'm going to say that I will probably have quite a bit of exposure to Tajay Sharp. He gets fed targets. Uh, if you look, he averages about 17 a game. You could see 20, 25 targets in this game. Uh, they're slightly da- projected to be down the game. They could throw the ball just a lot in that game. They like to throw the ball as it is. So Tajay Sharp is my number one play on both sides. At 6,800 on FanDuel, it's going to be very hard not to have him in my lineups. He could easily put up a 10 to 12 catch, 150 yards, two touchdown type game. Um, so I really like him. I think Jakeem Grant is at a great price point. I like their matchup this weekend a little bit. Uh, I like Oklahoma this week. I think Sterling Shepard has a decent matchup as well. And then also you have the Western Kentucky game. They should throw the ball around. So you got Taewon Taylor and Jared Dangerfield. It's just a matter of targeting which one you think is going to get the looks. Dangerfield has been way more involved in the offense the last couple of weeks. So it seems like he's finally starting to get the targets that he had seen last year. 
Yep. Joe, from your perspective, again, trying to do this, the season long daily fantasy balancing act of what you're offering to your readers when you're looking for wide receivers and situations like Baylor and Western Kentucky and Bowling Green State, are you choosing the guy getting the most targets? Are you, how are you making the decisions on the one and two or even three wide receivers on each of these rosters who could on any given day go for 10 receptions, 150 yards and two TDs? I have always thought in, in season long, the hardest thing to draft, the hardest thing to find is a consistent wide receiver. That's why I think what, what, you know, TJ Sharp is doing, what Josh Doxon is doing, what Roger Lewis, Corey Coleman, what these guys are doing, we just don't see every year at the wide receiver position. This has been, you know, annually a very inconsistent position. So to see that consistency, it's hard to not jump on those guys and really ride them on a week-to-week -week basis. So with that being said, Sean, I couldn't agree with you more with a lot of the names that you threw out. The only one that I'm worried that you threw out with is Sterling Shepard. There just seems to be sometime a little inconsistency. Baker Mayfield's having a great year, but it could be Deron Neal. It could be D.D. Westbrook. It's a shame because Samaj P. Ryan really just hasn't had the play he's had um, last year. But that's the only one of the names you threw out that I'm a little cautious of on, as far as the high-end players. How about the middle and low tier guys? Are there, uh, Joe, individuals, uh, wide receivers who are in a position to maybe exceed value guys who, for one reason or another, lower price tags, lower yep. on the depth chart that you think have an opportunity to shine this weekend? I do. Uh, just like Sean said, Dangerfield's becoming more involved in the offense every week. He's 6,100 right now on DraftKings. I think he's got tremendous value. He gets no respect. Sorry, I had to. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Devario Montgomery. They got that Texas Tech game. Iowa State's up there. I threw out Sam Richardson earlier. He's got to throw it to somebody. It's going to be Alan Lazard. It's going to be Devario Montgomery. Montgomery's only 4,700. I, I think Mark and Michelle, 4,200 on DraftKings for UMass in that Bowling Green game could be tremendous value at 4,200. And remember the name Zach Austin, Texas Tech, right? They're without Ian Sadler. They're probably without Devin Lauderdale. Zach Austin's only 3,800. That'll be a good low-end play for you guys. And Robert Wheelwright, right? Nebraska's pass defense isn't great at all. They're probably without Alex Erickson and their starting tight end this week. That's got to leave Wheelwright as the number one target. He's only 3,200. And one name that I'll throw out on DraftKings that, that I think has a shot, because we talked about how much attention Leonard Fournette is getting with LSU. They're going to have to throw it at some point. Maybe this is the week they do it. Malachi Dupree, 3,600. This could be a really good week to jump on him. He could make a couple of big plays. I like him over at DraftKings, too, as a, as a low-value play. College football has so many amazing names uh, on a <laughs> weekly basis to go through that are fun to pronounce and fun to think about. I'm, I'm sure everybody's seen the the old Key and Peele uh, sketch uh, about uh, football names. I think the first one was about college uh, players. So uh, a good one to check out if you haven't. Uh, and Travis and Jeff in chat chiming in with uh, some of their plays as well. Yeah, uh, you know what? Real sure. quick, Jeff threw out Villaman, and I have him down on fan duels as well. So good job. Good catch there, Jeff. Sean, anybody from a value perspective that Joe or yourself haven't touched on yet? We don't have to give everybody away. It feels like we, we may be giving away a lot of plays here, but um, anybody <laughs> that you'd like to add on to that list? No, I thought Joe hit it pretty good. Um, I expect 50 to 60 balls thrown for um, UMass in that game, and Mark and Michael – could very easily see 10 targets in that game. If he sees 10 targets at 4,200, it's a great price, and he's cheap on FanDuel as well. Uh, I thought Zach Austin was a great thing as well. Uh, I'll give a little hot take here for Ben Pritchett's sake since he's not here. Is Two weeks ago, I was all in on Garrett Dieter. No one was in on him. He had like 9 for 96, something like that. He probably should have had like 12 for 130. So basically what the Bowling Green offense does is they have Dieter and Roger Lewis on the outsides, Burbrink and Ronnie Moore in the slots. So what they do is whenever a team decides to shut down Roger Lewis, they go to Garrett Dieter. So it's a matter of which one they look. If you look through the game logs this year, there's been two games where Roger Lewis was not very good. Both of those games, Garrett Dieter had, I believe, seven for like 120 and a touchdown or two, and then nine for 96, plus he had about 15 targets in that game. So I feel like this could be a week where they try to shut down uh, Roger Lewis a little bit. And you look at Garrett Dieter, he's 4,200 on DraftKings, he's cheap on both sites, he could easily see 15 targets in the game where they're projected to score about 40-plus points. When you have that kind of opportunity at 4,200 even, 
even if he has six for 60 and a touchdown, that's a great return for that price. Let's uh, touch on some tight ends quickly, and then we can move on to, to some top plays from the night slate before we get to Joe's start, sit, and, and say so long for yet another Thursday edition of the College Football Show from FantasyInsiders.com. Um, tight end position, Sean, you touched on it. You have the extra flex on DraftKings. You're focusing here on FanDuel, obviously. Some of these players are in the wide receiver pool over on DraftKings and may present some value if they're heavy targets, if they're guys who are involved in the offense. But uh, is there one or two names at tight end that you're uh, considering on FanDuel that you think uh, are, are good values and should at least return on investment? Uh, back to the UMass game. It looks like Rodney Mills is going to play. You need to check on that. He's been dinged up. If he plays and if he's healthy, he's the number one tight end by far and should probably be a lock in your lineup with no Higby on the slate. Uh, Rodney Mills had a really good game a couple weeks ago, got injured towards the end of that game, and UMass really uses their tight ends, and it's a big game. So if Rodney Mills is going to be playing and healthy, he should be in every fan of lineup that you really put out there just because he's really the only tight end that has the massive upside and a good floor. Uh, I like Mark Andrews as well for Oklahoma. Back to them. Like I said, I like them. Um, and then Tony Fumagalli, he should get the looks for Wisconsin at tight end this week because it looks like Austin Trailer's out. So he's 2400 so he's a little bit cheaper play for you. Joe, any items to add there? Any player names? Or, or feels as though Sean checked off a lot of boxes there. He, he, he checked about every single one that I looked at. Maybe Eliza Jones over there at Notre Dame. That would probably be the only name I would add on to that list. But uh, I, I think Sean hit it right on the, on the head. All right, guys, let's make a quick transition into the night slate. Maybe not as in-depth here as uh, we've talked about on the show. Uh, typically, the... Research starts somewhere around lineup lock on Saturday for, for the late slate for a lot of people, 12.01 turns, and, and you start looking at what games are available. But to give our, our viewers and our listeners as we post this to Podbean and to iTunes uh, later on tonight, where are we looking at as top plays on the night slate, Sean? Are, are, is there a quarterback you're locking in on? Are there games that you feel like are, are the ones that you're going to be most involved in? How do you feel about this slate overall? Uh, you know, I like the slate a little bit. Um, I like Boykin. It's hard not to like the boykin Doxon combo. They're just hard to put in there. Um, I like BYU. I think BYU has a good matchup this weekend against East Carolina. Mitch Matthews has seen a lot of targets. So if you look at, like, Tanner Mangum, uh, there's some cheap guys. Skylar Howard's got a pretty decent matchup. He's pretty cheap. Kent Myers went uh, just off. He went off last weekend, and he's still very cheap. So I think those are just some plays I'm looking at. I don't really have any locks, per se, at the quarterback spot. You have the one high-end guy. And then it looks like I got a lot of guys in the middle to low tier. Joe, we'll touch on, as I said, uh, your start sits in, in just a short while. Uh, yep. So maybe not uh, all, all of your plays here, but uh, are there a couple of late slate quarterbacks that you're keeping an eye on uh, as part of your rankings and as part of uh, all the research you do over there at the CFF site? Well, I, it, I like Kent Myers, just what Sean said. I mean, for the value he's at, for the dual threat ability you're going to get, he, he had mentioned earlier about how you really need that running threat, that dual threat, if you could put it in on both sides in the air and on the ground. You know, I, I think that's a guy that you really need to look at. Other than that, you know, you're looking at Boise State, Colorado State, Arkansas, Alabama. There is some defense on the slate. I am. I can't, I can't say I'm ever worried about Travone Boykin, um, but I, I am a little bit worried. I'll touch on this a little bit later. Maybe I'm not – I don't know. I don't know if he performs as much as, as high as we have him in the rankings at Kansas State. I could be wrong on that. Um, but, but, but Boykin's your other big gun in that late slate as well. But I'd say Kent Myers and Boykin, I mean, obviously, for me, that would be one too, and I just like Myers' value. Let's touch on some running backs uh, Sean, again, names that, that you're keeping an eye on as we move forward, guys that as you research Friday and Saturday, you're going to keep coming back to. I know we already mentioned uh, Cook with his uh, questionable status. That's something to keep an eye on throughout the day. Anybody else uh, that you're considering uh, that we need to, to be aware of? Um, I like Devontae Booker. It's hard not to like a guy that's going to get 30-plus touches. Uh, he's obviously expensive. And then you go down towards the bottom. I like Wendell Smallwood again. Uh, I think he's a good match. The only issue I have with that is watch the last couple weeks, and Russell Shell is sure getting a lot of carries, so it's a little worry. And then I like Algernon Brown a bit for BYU back to that game. Um, Adam Hine is out for the year. Algernon Brown got about 20 carries last week. And then uh, Lawan Hunt, he doesn't see tons 
of uh, volume, but he's been pretty productive in it, and it's a decent matchup for him. Yep. Joe, one or two running backs, just to keep these names flowing out there, give uh, our listeners and viewers uh, a, a wide array of options. Well, look, we've touched on Wendell Smallwood for West Virginia in the past. He just gets a lot of touches. I, the one guy that I really love for you season-long guys that have been out there, and for those that don't get San Jose State on the slate off, and Tyler Irvin is an absolute monster. He won't be stopped. He is going to be. We have him rated as the number one running back this week. Look for a monster week from him. And I think Justin Silman over at Kansas State is a nice play against TCU this week who just can't stop anyone. And he seems like he has taken over that lead role, and he's likely to get 15 to 20 carries this week against TCU. Let's round it out with some wide receivers. We'll touch on a tight end or two if you guys have options. But, Joe, we'll start with you here. Wide receivers uh, that you're locking in on for, for Saturday night. Not saying they're locking your lineup, but during your research, uh, who you are focusing in on as top plays. Well, look, I think Isaiah Jones over at East Carolina, I think, still has a lot of value playing against BYU. That's one guy to be looking at. You've got the trio. you got what what you know, Durante and – and, and Shelton Gibson at West Virginia, it seems like they could go off at any time. But look, you got Josh Doxson right there. And we just talked about how consistency has rung the bell at receiver. And so it's hard to get away from Doxson on a, you know, on a week to week basis. But now I'm even looking at a guy like Spurback as well for Boise State might be a name to consider as well as some of the high end plays and on, you know, for this week. Sean, any names to fill in there as we uh, close out the wide receiver position? Yeah, like Joe alluded to, uh, I think most of the guys he said are pretty good. I've watched the West Virginia games, and it looks like Javon Durant's just so close, just exploding off, and he's still so cheap. So it's, it's going to be hard not to have him in line to that price point. Um, I like Britton Covey's little slot receiver for Utah. They use him a bit because Travis Wilson's arm is not very great, so they use him a bit. Um, I go back to targets. I like targets, and as Joe mentioned, Isaiah Jones is top 10 in the country in targets. So is Mitch Matthews. You got those two guys at a really reduced price point in a game that should be back and forth a little bit. Uh, they could each see 10, 15 targets in a game with a pretty reduced price point. It makes them pretty appealing. And uh, I need you guys to give me a frank and succinct scouting report on what's going to happen with Rutgers and Michigan State. <laughs> Come on. Go ahead, Sean. Go, you can go, go first. Oh, no, I'm going to go first? <laughs> I, I, guys, I know I know what's going to happen between Rutgers and Michigan State. I'm I am not blind to uh, the deficiencies there of uh, of the Scarlet Knights. Uh, but it is a blackout. Come on, they're they're yes. the, they're all wearing black, so things so happen. So you're saying there's right? a chance? Yeah, exactly. Caruso. As, as you can tell, Dan, we're both extremely excited for that game. Uh, I could see Michigan State just running all over Rutgers with every back they have. That's all I see really out of that game. Maybe a little Aaron Burbridge in there. No problem. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. I'll hold out hope until the final whistle, as I always do. And usually I'm sad after that, so that's fine. Um, 2006 was a wonderful year, as long ago as it was. Um, so as we go through this, Sean, and you're building lineups and you're trying to determine your, your cash lineup and whether or not you play a different tournament lineup or not, are you considering... What's your first consideration as as we leave this show? What's your first consideration when constructing a lineup in college football? Uh, you mentioned NHL. You mentioned college football are sort of your main focuses. These are uh, college football more so are more of a niche sport. Uh, the guys watching right now are, are, are heavily involved. But somebody getting into college football, what's your way of, of sitting down and starting to break down some of, some of the data and what you're looking at first? Uh, you know, college football is a big time niche sport. It takes a lot of effort. You have to put in a lot of effort. You got to read Twitter. You got to read articles. You got to look at box scores. You got to you got to follow every injury, and you got to talk to beat writers. Um, basically, what I try to look at each week is I try to look at where the injuries are, where the new value is. I try to lock in on the go-to guys for the week and see who should be in each and every lineup. For example, earlier in the season when Desmond Epps was 3K and he got like 12, 15 catches for 200 yards or whatever. Uh, the key is to just make sure I find those guys and then work my way out from there. So I try to find like those three or four guys I think are great value. Now, Grant, they might not always be cheap. They could be a Josh Doxson who is going to just explode. Uh, but it's just making sure I find those guys and I'm not missing any of those spots. Makes a lot of sense. And again, what we mentioned earlier was that you can't lock into something 
as a specific way to build your lineup every week. It's going to be different depending on where value is and, and top plays are, uh, but makes a lot of sense of, of where you're looking for information. Ben's mentioned before, Joe's mentioned it as well. Of College football is a different nut to crack right now. Still, there, there aren't as much, there isn't as much information, certainly when it comes to injuries. There is not a lot of information, whether you blame HIPAA or, or the way uh, uh, these coaches construct their uh, practices and their injury lists, but uh, things to keep an eye on. Joe, we are going to give you the floor. We're going to give you the opportunity to go through your start sits, uh, and then I will ask you both before we leave for who is your top play of the day, who you expect uh, to be the, the, the top option for the college football early slate, we'll focus on who your top option is, and then we'll we'll head out for the night. So, Joe, your start sit for Saturday. Sounds good. Uh, you know, let me go ahead and address Travis in the chat room. Turpin for uh, TCU receiver. You know, um, the Colby listen be supposed to be back this week, and if he's back, I, I don't know if he carries the value that he did last week. So, here we go. Uh, look, last week we brought you guys some some names that we thought were going to underperform and could outperform the rankings that we have posted on the website. We'll start there, end it with the uh, with the start bench, and then we'll wrap it up, Dan. Uh, so, look, we'll go to the quarterback position. The guys that we're really worried about this week just you know are they going to perform the way that they that they usually do Travone Boykin against Kansas State they do play on the road and look Kansas State is known to bring spring a surprise it wouldn't surprise me at all if K-State is able to play with and maybe even give TCU some trouble a little uh, this week so that's I don't think Boykin's going to struggle it's just a caution flag and Keenan Reynolds Navy against Notre Dame right triple option who do you take away the fullback or the quarterback Running backs, Dalvin Cook, Florida State. Does he play? Does he not? If he plays, how much does he play? Be careful with him. Be careful of Shock Linwood. If that game gets out of hand too soon, Baylor could, you know, he, they could pull him early, makes Jefferson a good play. At the receiver, we have Rashard Higgins, the Donovan Harden, Georgia State. Some of these guys are not on the, on the slate, but just some names we'll throw out to be cautious of this week. Guys that we do think could outperform their rankings. Riley Neal, quarterback, Ball State. Sam Richardson, quarterback, Iowa State, playing Texas Tech. Running backs, Robert Lowe, Texas State. Chase Price, San Diego State, playing Hawaii. And receivers, we think Farrow Cooper against LSU and Jordan Villeman, uh, the receiver at Oregon State, could outperform their rankings this week. So those are two names to watch out at receiver. So with that being said, here we go. Start bench week six. All right, here we go, guys. We're going to start off with the bench, and we're going to start off at that Indiana-Penn State game that we talked about a little earlier. Nate Sudfeld, Jordan Howard, both with ankle injuries. Nate Sudfeld's probably going to play, but, you know, even if he does play, he's likely to be a stationary target in the pocket, and he's facing a Penn State defense that's ranked number nine in the FBS in points allowed per game and number 18 in passing yards allowed per game. So I think Nate Sudfeld is a safe bench this week to start week six. Terrell Newby, running back Nebraska, playing at home against Wisconsin. You know, guys, Newby's only topped the 100-yard mark once this season. He hasn't scored a touchdown since week two, and this week the Cornhuskers host the Badgers. And you know what? They're only one of four teams that have allowed 10 points fewer, fewer than 10 points per game this season. They're ranked 14th in the FBS in rushing yards allowed per game, fewer than 100 yards. I think Terrell Newby needs to be on the bench this week. Kelvin Taylor. If you listen to us every week, for some reason it seems like I don't like Kelvin Taylor. But, you know, he's not exactly piling on the yardage, and but he has scored in four of the Gators' five games this week. Well, I mean this year. This week, Florida travels to Missouri to face a Tigers defense ranked number 23 in the nation against the run. And Taylor's lowest single game rushing output, 45 yards, was in week three against Kentucky, which happens to be their only road game of the season thus far. We think Kelvin Taylor, week six, uh, week six bench at Missouri. And Leontay Carew over there at Rutgers. Dan, I hate to tell you, but you know what? I just don't know what we're going to get this week. And I'd rather get another week from him to see if he's really, in fact, in game shape. Uh, he's got too much talent to keep him off the field. But I'm going to play it safe instead of sorry. I'm going to bench with Leontay Carew this week in uh, week six. And then we go over to the Michigan Northwestern game. Who's going to, you know, is, is Devion Smith going to be healthy with Michigan? Is it going to be Drake Johnson? You got Justin Jackson over there at Northwestern. You know, guys, I don't really think it matters right now. You know, these are two of the top defenses in the nation squaring off in the big house. Northwestern's ranked number one in scoring defense, a seven points allowed per game. The Wolverines are number two, 7.6 points per game. Where the scoring is going to come from? I mean, most, both of the defenses are ranked in the top five in yards 
allowed. You know, don't be surprised if you see more scoring from the defenses and the kickers this week than you do from the offensive players. So we're benching the entire offense in Northwestern versus Michigan. And that runs down your bench for week six. We're going to go over to the starts, guys. One guy that's not on the DFS slate, and we'll throw him out there really quick because we'll mention his name, Larry Rose, New Mexico State, playing at Ole Miss. Maybe a name that you see later on in the slates down the line. This guy's topped 180 rushing yards in back-to-back -back games, but make no mistake about it. It was against UTEP and it was against New Mexico. But in week one, guys, in week one at Florida, Rose topped 100 total yards and did find the end zone. And you know what? Ole Miss is allowing 140 rushing yards per game. So we're not going to be surprised to see him finish week six with over 100 total yards and a touchdown. And the 17 fantasy points is good enough for your running back two, three, or flex. Larry Rose should be in your starting lineup. We're going to stick with the running back, Joseph Yerby, running back Miami, playing at Florida State. You know, the Seminoles are one of the better defenses in the nation. They're only allowing 11.5 points per game, but they're giving up a modest 150 rushing yards per game, and Yerby's looking for his fourth consecutive 100-yard game. The sophomore back has scored in every game this season, so you know what? We're going to ride that streak. Even though Florida State has only given up one rushing touchdown this year, we're going to call for Joseph Yerby a week six start at Florida State. And then we're going to stay with the running back. And we're going to do something that we normally don't do, guys. This goes against the grain for us. We usually don't start running backs against Alabama defenses, especially in Tuscaloosa. But we're going with Alex Collins this week. You know what? Alex Collins is averaging 26 touches in Arkansas's last four games. And he has scored in every game this season. If we're going to ride Larry Rose of New Mexico State and we're going to ride Miami's Joseph Yearby, then why not do the same with Alex Collins, who could generate at least 100 yards and a touchdown against the Crimson Tide defense on Saturday? Then we'll throw out another guy. We mentioned him already. Sean, you mentioned him early. Seth Collins, Oregon State quarterback at Arizona. You know, Collins is growing into his role as the starting quarterback, and he's doing it on the ground and in the air. Two weeks ago against Stanford, he threw for a career-high 275 yards. He's already gone over 100 yards rushing in the game twice this season. This week, we're expecting the freshman to put the total package together to do it with his legs and his arms when the Beavers travel to Arizona. Now, check this out, guys. The Wildcats are giving up 35 points per game, and they're allowing 192 rushing yards per game. Only 10 teams in the FBS have given up more rushing touchdowns than Arizona, and the Wildcats have allowed season highs in scoring to three of the five opponents they've played this year. UTSA has scored 32, Stanford has scored 55, and UCLA has scored 56. Those were all season high for those teams up until this point. Seth Collins, find a way to get him in your lineup. Week six start. And we're going to end it with this guy. You know what? I always seem to end it with the young guys. We did it with Markel Jones a couple of weeks ago. We touched on our preseason draft guide, how much we like the Cortland Suttons of SMU, the Christian Kirks of Texas A&M. We've just jumped on uh, Saquon Barkley. You know, we've mentioned all these guys in our articles. Well, you know what? This week, here's the start, guys. Calvin Ridley, wide receiver, Alabama. These freshmen just have too much talent to continue to ride shotgun. It seems like Alabama is coming into their own, and we don't think Ridley's five catch 120 yard one TT performance is an aberration. We think he's ready to take it to the next level, and fantasy owners can expect bigger and better things to this guy as the season progresses. Week six start, Calvin Ridley, Alabama wide receiver. Sean, Dan, that's your week six start bench. We'll get to uh, each of your your top. Well, it can be a hot take if you want, but your your top play for for the weekend. Uh, but Travis does have one last question before we go. I meant to ask this earlier, but is Heard a legit, a legitimate? I'm going to read that out. Uh, tournament option versus uh, OU on Saturday. So Sean, to you, is Heard an option for tournament play? Uh, he's an option. I would probably look elsewhere. I just don't think that he's been producing enough, and I, I he's not at a big enough discount. I mean, he is 5,500 on DraftKings, but like Joe said, Seth Collins could put up 40 this weekend, and he's 7K. I, I would look to go up to Seth Collins, who actually might not be as highly owned as he should be just because he plays for Oregon State and hasn't – they haven't been that great this year, so he might not be as owned as uh, most people would expect him to be. Always interested to see ownership percentages on West Coast teams that are not the, the name teams per se because of perception, because they play late at night typically, and and uh, your casual or, or semi-casual college football fan may not be as aware of them. 
uh, as we move forward. So before we go, Joe, you first, who's a guy that you just think, is it Collins? Is it, is that where you're going? Is it somebody else that you think is a top play for Saturday? I, you know, I, Seth Collins, I love Seth Collins. I love the matchup. Whenever a defense has given up that many points to an opponent, it's hard not to like a guy. But I'm telling you right now, I, I don't think you can go wrong riding Leonard Fournette or, or Tyler Irvin in the late slate. I just love those two running backs. I think they're slam dunks. John, how about for you? I would not recommend fading Tajay Sharp this week. Uh, he's going to be in pretty much every one of my lineups. I think you're looking at a... 35 to 40 point fan duel or 35 to 40 point draft Kings game for him. Uh, I just think they're going to throw the ball around. He's going to see 20 targets and he's just going to explode in that game. There is plenty of content for you guys to digest over the past hour. Also over on fantasyinsiders.com. Fear my turtle uh, has the write up uh, at fear my turtle DFS on Twitter for the early slate. Late Slate will be posted tomorrow. If you're not yet a member or a subscriber to Fantasy Insiders, head on over to fantasyinsiders.com slash plans. It's all the information you need to know uh, about how to get a subscription, the one that's right for you. Uh, Sean, thanks for pinch hitting. Amazing content from you. Welcome back anytime. Ben can be on vacation for another week. We, we can figure <laughs> this out if, if you want to come back next week. Who, who needs that? Right? As always, uh, great content. Uh, head on over to the cffsite.com for... Uh, rankings for news uh, and follow them on Twitter at the CFF site. With that said, we wish you the best of luck on Saturday slate. We'll see you back here on next Thursday at 11 PM to talk more college football. Have a great night guys.